Uh, gee, the most provocative thing. Um, <clears throat> well, per, I, I, I'm sure that the most most provocative thought is that uh, th that I, I I brought up was that we are at or or very near the end of economic growth as as we've known it over the past few decades, and it and this is an assertion that I'm sure some of you would disagree with. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it, it seems to me and many of my colleagues, some of whom are, are e economists, others energy experts and uh, e experts in resource management and so on, that this is, this is really key to our, uh, our, our understanding the territory ahead of us and our, and our ability to, to adapt to it, uh, whether it's because of climate change or resource depletion or uh, energy constraints or a combination of, of all, all three, it it's really seems almost inevitable that we are facing a, a, a century of, it, at best, economic stasis and more likely economic contraction. Uh, and no one wants to talk about that. It has no political constituency whatsoever. Uh, no constituency in industry, uh, among professional economists, uh, you can go right down the line. Uh, but that doesn't keep it from being an important consideration that is uh, worthy of, of very serious um, discussion. Well, that ought to get people going. Uh, <laughs> next, Tabu, Nabu. Um. The most provocative thing I have said uh, is probably about the nuclear power, um, because uh, uh, the Canada is, the, let's say, has a technology so-called can do. It hasn't uh, done well enough. Uh, of course, uh, this is a very uh, interesting technology, which I mentioned was this integral fast reactor. It is uh, the prism reactor of the GE, which was developed at the Algon National Laboratory, which supposedly uh, showing the uh, interesting feature of passive safety, uh, proliferation resistant, and also the ease of the waste management disposal. So, in this, I am saying that uh, the success of the light water reactor uh, managed by the Admiral Rickover of the U.S. Navy was so successful that it was crowding out the fast reactor research. So currently, still the fast reactor is in the research mode, while light water reactor was very much of success. Um, Especially because the U.S. government or Navy needs to develop it quickly for the military purposes. Of course, light water reactor is very safe in the water. So the uh, submarine or nuclear vessels is the best way to test and use it as a light water reactor's feature. So it, it's very, it shows clear risk of putting them into the, onto, the, onto land. So the commercial light water reactor has an uh, inherent risk if the shortage of water occurred, and uh, it had happened in, in Fukushima. So I think it is now the time to rethink about the paradigm of the nuclear power. The technology of this uh, fast reactor called integral fast one. I'm not the engineer background, so I cannot tell exactly uh, uh, that this technology is about. But uh, from what I have heard, maybe this technology, there are plenty of different nuclear technologies, but this is the one which fits to the countries with the huge amount of uh, spent fuel from the light water reactor system. So there are many different kind of uh, nuclear technology which I learned. And uh, uh, because engineers or technicians are always very proud of his own uh, child. And all others are dumb, but your child is uh, brilliant. So I cannot tell which one is really brilliant and the, what, what are the defects. So, but in the usual commercial, uh, let's say, uh, product uh, marketing, yes, some product is fitting to the certain uh, 
uh, customer, and uh, the nuclear reactors are not exceptions. So there's some kind of reactor, like uh, high temperature gas reactors fit to the country using the heat from the uh, nuclear power. Like the Middle Eastern uh, countries of needing heat for or desalination purposes, yes, maybe it fits to this country. The countries with light water reactor spent fuel need some kind of uh, reactor which can really solve this uh, spent fuel issue. So I feel that um, I didn't know this reactor until about two years ago because I noticed this technology simply because those who are engaged in developing technology are really getting nervous. They are getting older and older and uh, they are very much concerned that technology will be lost totally when they die out. So promoting this technology for the sake of uh, maintaining capacity and knowledge, and I think uh, this is a kind of interesting idea to try. So even though it is provocative, probably in Japan, I'm the single person probably of promoting fast reactor now. I, I was very much often told by many of my colleagues, you are crazy because nobody can really talk about the fast reactor thing after Fukushima. I fully agree. But, well, I, I just, I'm just trying with uh, the chance and uh, we'll see what would happen. Thank you. Chris. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, I guess the most controversial thing that I had to say. That's interesting. Um, human nature is we don't like to be disrupted. And we will pay money to not be disrupted. Um, that changes when the threat is imminent. So when it's, when it's a life or death situation, we will do amazing things and drive amazing change. But until there is a life or death situation, we are trained to do one thing, and that is grow. That is to want more. Um, that is human nature. To survive and thrive are the two things that have driven, human, driven mankind, personkind, for centuries, for millennia. So from a perspective of innovation, from a perspective of technology, your best chances are to not disrupt until such time as there is threat to survival. Your best chances are to integrate, to improve, and to enable the system to deliver more with the same resources or to deliver the same with less resources, but to minimize disruption in doing so. We are human, and if we act like this is not a human problem with human responses, then we're throwing money down whatever <laughs> garbage device you want to throw it down. Um, and all we're doing at that point is wasting money. So, disruption. That is the biggest thing you can take away in a single word and what to do about it. Okay, your turn. Who would like to uh, raise a hand and challenge any of these fine gentlemen's thoughts or any other thing that you've heard today? Okay, I'm going to have to call on somebody quickly. All right, and please use your mic. Thank you. And would you tell us who you are, too, please, just so we know who to blame for your comment? You're supposed to laugh, people. You're supposed to laugh. It was uh -oh. not serious. Yeah, uh, my name's Eddie, uh, former engineer in the coal industry. Um, just, is, sorry, is it Richard on the right? Um, I don't... I, I grapple with the human nature question a lot. I think it's, Chris, sorry. Uh, I think we're culturally trained. Humans can, you know, like I, I agree completely with what you say, you know, and that's the way the majority of the planet is culturally trained at the moment. But I think if there's some way we can train each other to live a bit differently, that might challenge what you said. Love it. Um, okay, no, I, I buy it, but this idea of disruption, right? What you're, sort of this, this idea of, of cultural change, what you're asking for is to re-engineer the very DNA that has driven survival of the race for centuries, right? We are wired. We are literally wired to survive first 
and then after that, we are wired to thrive. And that is the job, right? And the first thing, the first thing we do is survive. Um, and, and it's about imminent threat. So I, I'm not disagreeing with you, and, and I guess this is the difference between um, aspiration and uh, pragmatism, I guess, is, a, is, is the word I would use. How long will it take us to be op more open to disruption and to rewire the very premise which survival of the human race has been based upon for longer than anyone has been around, you know, so as long as we were standing, right? That is, uh, so I, I agree with you, but at the same time, I, I think this is, that's the very disruption that we're fighting against. Um, at the back? Oh, sorry, um, did you want to jump in? All right, one, one moment. Just, just very briefly, just a, a, a friendly challenge. Um, per, are, are we perhaps nearing that survival uh, dilemma that, that would uh, result in, in uh, uh, acceptance of disruption of behavior? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 the, the friendly challenge gets a, a, a direct answer. And again, uh, sorry, I'll complete the question. You might have had more. Well, um, uh, for example, in, in wartime Britain, people accepted rationing. Uh, whereas in early 20th century U.S., the uh, the incentives were in the other direction, and we developed consumerism. It wasn't it, it didn't come out of the blue. It was a project of American industry and the the, the new advertising industry fresh on the scene. So uh, human human desires and behaviors have have are are engineered under varying circumstances, and we're entering a, a very different set of circumstances. Perfect. Okay. Um, because what you just described is exactly in line with what I'm thinking, right? The time of um, greatest change are the times of greatest conflict, right? So when our survival is implicitly threatened in times of conflict and times of war, yes, we will put up with remarkable hardships. We will accept disruption because that disruption um, is seen as vital to survival. Um, so it's not just the, the rationing side. I can think of industrial examples where conflict set up incredibly remarkable change. So if you look at the, the entire uh, polymer industry um, in the United States, dating back to you know, the 1920s when it was, it was nylon and DuPont and all the rest, right? The time of the most significant change in the polymer industry were between the years of 1939 and 1948. It went from, what, about 3,000 tons of polymer capacity in the United States to, I think, around 100 and 110,000 um, tons. That's unheard of in terms of the amount of capex put in. Why was that investment made? It's because the, the stream, the availability of feedstock coming out of Asia to drive the polymer business uh, from those resources was no longer available. There was a threat to survival. So we drove a massive industrial change, a massive industrial complex. Why? Because the survival was threatened, because our growth was threatened in times of conflict. So I absolutely agree with you. If, and this is doomsday stuff, right? The biggest, um, the biggest probability is substantial change in terms of energy is if we start having conflict around energy and if we start having conflict around water. This is, I mean, it's a horrible thing to say, right? But in ti times of conflict drive the fastest adoption of technology in any given time around the world since the Industrial Revolution. So I agree with you, but at the same time, I think the premise that um, we've reached that point now, no. Um, and again, I, I make the analogy between um, water in Israel and what happened there, which is implicit to survival, and energy, which th there's no three-year imperative around energy. It doesn't exist. That's the difference. We're, we're still dealing with decades-long imperatives around energy. That urgency doesn't drive the substantial change that I, that I think you're, you, you would like to see. I guess I'm One seeing... One rebuttal, uh, and yeah, then we'll move yeah, on. I, I guess I'm seeing uh, uh, developments emerging faster than you are, in bo both in energy supply and in, in, uh, in uh, climate impacts. And uh, I, I think we may be in a, a much more of a survival situation than, than, uh, than we are now in a relatively short amount of time. 
Thank you. Well, that got at least got the panelists going. I have a question back yep. here and then over here. Thank and you. And then let me just ask a question on that. They both disagree. So if we're decision makers, how do we respond to that? How do we prepare for two different alternatives? But you can think about that while we take some yeah. more questions. Uh, thank you, Nancy. It's Julian Taylor here. Um, that, uh, that last discussion actually was, uh, I, I, my question was much like Richard's uh, was there. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, because Chris, you had said that disruptive technologies um, are, are difficult to accept and uh, my, my question to you was going to be, well, what about disruptive society? Because um, I tend to align myself with Richard that uh, I think we're facing some, some very significant disruptions to our uh, standard, to the, to the way of living that we have become accustomed to in the next few decades, God knows how far out. Um, but when such changes come, uh, whether driven by um, four degrees warming or whatever it may be, um, that there can be v very substantial changes in human values. Sure, to maintain um, one's, to try and hold on to what we've got, but uh, with different values, we might be, uh, realize that there is less, um, that we need to move away from this consumerism and not to hold on to that. Just your thoughts, please. Uh, n not sure quite how to respond. Um, I, I guess I'm I'm not quite sure of the qu of the question. Um, if you can, that was more of a comment than a question. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, no. I, and, and again, I, I I'm I'm not. I am f fully aligned with the idea that um, things will eventually have to change. Um, I, I think there's disagreement on what the drivers for that change will be, what the speed of that change will be, and what are the decisions we can take in the interim to best prepare us for wherever we end up when the sort of the more catastrophic failure occurs, right? Um, when there's, the imperative is not strong enough right now to drive the, ty to drive the type of disruption to consumerism, the type of disruption at the government level, the type of disruption at the corporate level, it's just not strong enough right now. So the best thing we can do is prepare for the future by integrating the, the, the technology and the innovation that can position us to mitigate the risk once the catastrophic failure occurs. I know it's a doomsday scenario, right? But eventually we'll get to the Israel moment. We'll get to the Israel water moment and then we'll act and then we'll move. And like I say, remarkable change at remarkable scale can happen at a time when there is a remarkable recognition of the need to change. Um, and that's the, the plenty of historical precedent for that. So I, I agree with you. At the same time, I think the, um, I, the, I disagree in, from a timeline perspective. Uh, just following up on the disruption comment again, Chris, um, some of the other industries that we're all familiar with have gone through great disruptions, um, maybe not the energy fields, but uh, the internet has brought incredible disruption and sort of the uh, common uh, knowledge, I guess, that we all live by recently is Clayton Christensen's innovative dilemma. And, and so what you're saying is very different from that. And um, in the Lux research that we've talked about, the uh, bio-based material and chemicals, you see these clusters of established industries that only in the last five or six years have grouped incredibly around these new technologies. And so, um, you know, you've got all the big super majors looking at uh, bio-based materials. So are, is that a hedge? What, what, what are those companies seeking? Um, are they trying to protect their incumbency and, and leverage the new technologies to ensure that when those become commercially viable that they'll be positioned to exploit those to the maximum. What, how, how, I mean, it seems that that industry is disrupting or is innovating very, very quickly. But, but what you're saying is that it's not going to happen until some moment tips the balance of, of survivability. Or you know, I'm just trying to with the commercial you know desire to dominate and win in this game is very strong. So. 
Um, it seems that that disruption is going to come uh, through commercial means, just like it did with the internet, and suddenly, you know, we all book our flights directly. We don't go to a travel agent anymore. Is that you? Yeah. So there were two angles on that, right? Um, the first one is, yeah, it's a track record of disruption that comes from the ITC space, right? Um, so internet and connectivity and all of these these big mega trends that are out there. A um, couple of underlying principles on that. Um, First one is that brought massive efficiency into into the corporate world as well as into the government world. I mean, so there was a tremendous amount of efficiency there that was coupled with the disruption. So the amount of efficiency was brought out, and the disruption that was there was not actually disrupting, negatively disrupting anything that existed. It was actually bringing um, efficiencies. Um, so I guess it was more like a positive disruption more than a displacement of existing approaches. So that's, there's a subtle difference in there in the internet age. The other part of this that, that's really important, it is a lot easier to, to deploy um, zeros and ones and to do things at a zeros and ones scale than it is to do things at an atoms, molecules and sort of a, a, a much larger scale, right? The, the capex intensity of the change we're talking about in the energy space is vastly different than any capex intensity that was talked about in the internet age. So to compare those two, I think, is a fallacy um, in terms of the innovation that exists. I, I, I think we've got to set that aside. Um, if, you, if you want to invest in the internet space, I can show you a truckload of venture capitalists that did very well. I can show you these same venture capitalists that were disastrously bad at investing in energy. Disastrously bad. There's a reason for that. The same principles don't apply. They just fundamentally don't apply. Okay, so that's my first. There were two questions, right? Um, second question. Um, what is driving the adoption of bio-based materials and chemicals? Um, that started as a hedge, uh, but it was actually a very cautious hedge. There was no, none of the really significant chemicals and materials players were aggressively attacking that space until they started to see some pretty significant changes in um, the feedstock prices. So once it became clear that C1 was going to be abundant, C2 was going to be eh, okay, C3 was going to start to fade away, and all my C4 chemicals and above, so my, my more complex chemicals and materials, once they started to disappear, then we're making a straight economic decision, right? That's about how do I keep, how do we keep the lights on? How do I keep growing? How do I keep supplying succinic acid, adipic acid? All uh, BDO, all of these more complex chemicals. You can look at it right now. Um, we're, we're, we're getting to a point where the bio-based processes got more efficient and where the um, pitch chemical-based feedstocks got more expensive. And right now we're at a crossover point and that's why they're, why they're aggressively pursuing that. That is pure economics. They would be more disrupted to stick with fossil-based fuels for that than they would be to, uh, to go with bio-based materials and the bio-based processes. So that's why, that's why we've reached a, a crossover point on that. Uh, Up here. I hope that was good. Yes, thank okay. you. Uh, Paul Willis, uh, th this is a question uh, for Richard uh, and, and Chris, I guess. Is there, there's, uh, we've, we've talked about survival uh, quite a bit. We're not doing anything until we worry about, uh, until we're, we're afraid we're not going to survive. But Chris, I'd like to kind of focus on your, your uh, we're wired for, to thrive and to grow. And, and Richard, uh, in your talk, I, I, I think you assumed that consumerism and GDP growth were the same. And I'd like to challenge that a little bit because we can have GDP growth without consumerism growth. A lot of the good things that you talked about in your last slide, uh, community, you know, recreation centers, uh, education, arts, all of that, in my opinion, can be GDP growth. So I think we can have growth, and if we tell society that you can't grow, you're just going to get worse, and that's our only motivation for them, I think that's the wrong way to approach it. I think we can grow, we just can't, but we can do it without consumerism. Um, well, uh, yes and no. Um, I, I, I completely agree we need s social goals to move toward and we need a sense that there is a way in which life is getting better 
Uh, but the way we measure that is very important. GDP is pretty narrow, actually. It, it really just measures the amount of money moving through an economy. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that, but not much. Uh, and uh, historically, GDP growth has been tied very closely to growth in consumption of energy and, and materials. Not, it's not an exact correlation, but it's very, very close. And, uh, and uh, that comes down to policy. In times of slow GDP growth, governments uh, promote consumption as a way of, of boosting GDP uh, because that's their target, that's their indicator, that's what they're, they're, uh, they, they've chosen as their metric of success. If we, if we want to make society and human life better in less tangible ways, we have to adopt indicators that are specific to those, those, those areas of improvement. Uh, and there, there has been a lot of work in, in, uh, in that. Uh, there is, is a, a GPI, or Genuine Progress Indicator, that's being used by the state of Maryland, by the city of Seattle, and, uh, and is being, has been discussed in, in many other arenas. Then there's the, the economics of happiness, pioneered by the little Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan, uh, which has, uh, since the 1970s, used uh, GNH, or gross national happiness, as, as a measure of, uh, of success. And uh, there's some effort at the United Nations to, to broaden the use of, of GNH internationally. Um, these are more complex metrics. GDP is very simple, and, and so moving from a simple indicator to a more complex indicator is, is difficult, but, uh, but the advantages of doing so, I think, are, are, are more than worth the trouble. I'm sorry, I've got to jump in here. I've got to defend the economics profession. GDP is not just consumer goods. GDP is investment. GDP is C plus I plus G, consumption plus investment, plus government spending. It is a macroeconomic indicator, nothing more, nothing less. GPIs, general progress indicators, are a series of indicators that look at individually composed measures and are aggregated in ways that are sometimes transparent and sometimes not. I'm not opposed to G GPIs and others, but GDP is measured, and it is complex, and I think that's part of the problem, that it gets a bit of a bad rap. The school teacher's wage goes into GDP. The park board's wage goes into GDP. And governments don't always spend for consumption. And I, I'll have to defend our federal government here, which is something I rarely do. But it's uh, when we had the economic downturn, what was the biggest expenditure item of the federal government? Quiz. Infrastructure investment. Where did that infrastructure investment go? Quiz number two. Hockey rinks public transit, you know, these are things that create GDP. So it is too simplistic to simply have a good guy and a bad guy. We need them all, and we need them all systematically measured. Our National Statistics Agency, Stats Canada, is measuring net national wealth, which is measured with the same rigor of GDP. And, you know, admittedly, GDP doesn't get household labor and uh, it does get imputed rent for household services. So we're measuring net national wealth. What's going into net national wealth? All the infrastructure we've got, the capital goods, and our natural resource wealth. So parallel accounts are really important, but let's get the, the blame on the appropriate thing. So, sorry, I'll take my prerogative as chair to argue with with my panelists that it's not as simple as that and GDP is not the enemy. It's not alone enough, but you don't want to throw it out because it's the indicator that we've got that does incorporate all the wages, all the income, all the expenditures depending on which way you do it. We should teach more of this in school, I think. I'm a professor, so it's part of well, uh, that was It was great that the federal government invested in infrastructure, but because they weren't, uh, push they weren't uh, advocating for any awareness of climate change, they've built in a lot of vulnerability by not building that infrastructure to new standards that might be able to withstand the kind of extreme weather we're seeing in Calgary and Toronto, that kind of thing. So uh, investment, if it's wise, is good, but if it's not made with uh, forethought, then not so good. 
My question is about the carbon budget that the, uh, the IPCC has presented. Um, we've got about 270 billion tons of carbon left in the budget, according to the IPCC's projection, which says there's a certain amount we can spend before we hit two degrees warming, which is what most people are hoping we're going to stay under. Uh, so current CO2 emissions, about 10 billion tons a year. <clears throat> the budget will be exhausted in 25 years. Uh, China's coal plants alone will burn that. Um, so how can we advance the concept of a carbon budget? How do we globally agree what we can spend it on? Uh, who can burn what, I guess? And uh, shouldn't we, if we've only got this much left that we can burn, be using it as, con as constructively as possible to find ways to substitute for the things we use the carbon for now? Yes, um, the, 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 the argument of this IPCC's report is that on the assumption that uh, to keep the two degrees Celsius, uh, let's say, limitation of the atmospheric temperature, the probability of, of maintaining two degrees by 50 percent, that is the amount of the carbon which could be uh, emitted historically. So, so calculating carbon budget as such, it's a kind of benchmark of effort of uh, CO2 emission reduction. So how to get China, uh, I mean, because the largest emitter is China, and, and then the United States, and then India, and all of these three uh, countries will probably emit about half of the CO2 towards 2035 or 2050. So the thing is, uh, uh, is how can these countries be convinced to do the very substantial reduction of the CO2 by somehow putting the carbon price? And uh, the carbon price we discussed in, in the session before, it should, the, let's say, uh, the British Columbia's carbon price is $30, but it should go up to 120 or more. Um, China is interesting because um, they are in the economic crisis to some extent, and their slowdown is happening. So uh, uh, they used to say, the Chinese negotiators used to say that peaking out of the CO2 emission comes uh, 2035 or after. But uh, some time ago, when I talked to the academics, they said, well, it comes much earlier, 2025. And even some of the report uh, says that it could happen in 2020s. If it is the case, uh, it's very close to what uh, this uh, IEA's 450 scenario looks like. And if China can really reduce CO2 emission after 2020, then this scenario of 450 ppm or 2 degrees Celsius may come reality. And uh, China's economic slowdown together with uh, its energy security concern of uh, reducing, um, let's say, uh, the energy consumption and the increased efficiency renewables, all of these efforts and targets which they set domestically may start working. And then what uh, China will ask is, hey, United States, you should do the same. So I am not uh, totally pessimistic about uh, the future. When China really comes to that stage and force others to do. But the problem is more India or Africa, when they have to really grow in per capita basis in the mobility or in the way of life, yeah, the price of energy is getting very high and could, can they really grow. This issue of economic growth lifestyle, yes, is very serious for them. India is always saying China has successfully uh, grown to the current level by using huge amount of coal. Let us do the same. That is a very legitimate requ request. While it cannot be done if we really set this target of CO2. So for the economic growth, sake, 
uh, we will come to the point, how can we really make kind of uh, uh, equal treatment of the late comers like uh, India? So there comes the issue of technology, there comes the issue of uh, carbon capturing and storage or use of the technology like nuclear power. The answer is still up in there, but uh, the, the cost of carbon will be enormously high around that time. And uh, the IA or all that kind of projection does not really uh, incorporate a change in lifestyle. This change in lifestyle, which I think uh, Richard or uh, Chris is to some extent mentioning, is probably the really necessary condition to achieve this, uh, let's say, CO2 emission reduction. Thank you. I've got over here and then over here. Uh, th I, this t question is double-barreled and isn't really targeting you guys up there, but all of us. But um, the first part of the barrel is, and I know others have raised this before, but if we're, most of us in this room, trying to convince the general population that the, a crisis is imminent and all the stuff we've all said all day, um, it just strikes me, if you stand up and say, this is the biggest crisis in the history of man and we don't have much time and then when the general population buys into that argument and then says okay what do we do next and then we say oh we'll we'll tax carbon I, I think the vast majority of the general population is either going to find that the solution that was just offered is completely inadequate given the risk that we've just tried to get them to, um, to buy into. If in 1978 we'd said we've finally accepted the science that says that lead fumes in gasoline are having significant harmful effects to your children, and they said, well, what should we do about it? And we said, okay, we'll just, we'll tax lead for a while. I, I, I don't think mothers and fathers would have found that a, um, a reasonable response. So, so setting aside sort of the academic idea that pricing carbon is the right answer, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that response is a useful response. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is, I'm sure everybody in this room knows, is that across the developed world, uh, which is different from the developing world, um, Typically, the 40% richest families have anywhere from 8 to 18 times the, uh, the average annual household income of the poorest 40%, but they only consume two and a half times much energy. So when you say, you know, tax it, you're saying, you guys in the bottom 40%, you're screwed. And 120 bucks a ton is not going to have any impact on the demand of the rich guys. I don't think the general population has to know the numbers to know the numbers. Their intuition tells them what I just said. And I don't see us moving forward with any social contract if that's what we keep, how we keep talking. Interesting question. Just, uh, just like a subsidy to the fossil fuel in the different countries, how to avoid the impact to the poor. So, yes, such, certainly social, uh, let's say, kind of support measures is necessary to alleviate, to make the poor the poorer. So, yeah, it, you should deal with that in a different um, uh, mechanism. While this uh, approach of uh, British Columbia is interesting, it's a revenue neutral carbon tax. So basically it, it doesn't impact, uh, try to avoid the impact to the, uh, the, the uh, income tax, uh, uh, but, uh, reducing the, let's say, poverty impact <laughs> through the carbon tax by consumption of energy. That is possible to, to make that kind of uh, approach. So. Supporting the poor is necessary social uh, uh, virtue and social policy, while 
making the wrong signal for consuming uh, the, uh, the fossil fuel, you have to get rid of. So, so you have to clearly differentiate to different uh, 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 economic policies as such. Thank you. Uh, Elma Sum. I'd like to ask a, a slightly different question. When I look at the name of the hosting organization, is the energy innovation. So uh, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, people in the audience are in the innovation business, providing uh, technology solutions and so on. And yet we have some uh, very expert panelists and among the audience, I'm sure, there are public policy specialists. Sometimes it appears that the two groups of communities are traveling in parallel highways. My question to Professor Tanaka and Professor Oliweiler are twofold. One, in your observations and experience, what are some of the best approach for the two communities and others to be able to work together? For example, the innovationists, how can they help to shape public policies? That's number one. Number two, since uh, Professor Tanaka is now in Japan and Professor Oli Weiler is right here, are there any cultural uh, aspects and business practices that uh, may be uh, slightly different and what are the best practices from both regions? Thank you. In Japan, how can innovation influence public policy? Give him the hard question. He's the big speaker. I'm just thinking of <laughs> how to answer that question. Um, innovation, well, there are plenty of uh, innovative people in, in Japan. Does it affect public policy? Y well, yes and no. That's, <laughs> that's probably the correct answer. Um, because uh, the Japanese uh, uh, government is trying to, let's say, uh, liberalize in uh, many of the regulations. Regulatory reform is uh, the top agenda for, for this current Abe government and to make uh, the innovative people to start their new business by uh, changing the regulation in, in uh, many different areas, healthcare, medical, uh, education, or in these all different services. Banking sector or information technology sector were very well taken already. So electricity generation, power generation is another area which uh, the government is trying to introduce more innovative uh, business. Um, Japanese culture is more conformity or uh, let's say uh, is uh, consensus building is the key elements uh, in, in, in the Japanese business. But uh, these days, uh, the young uh, generation, and especially the uh, female, the women, is getting playing more important role. And unfortunately, so far, the women were discriminated clearly. So if this changes, suddenly, uh, uh, let's say, the, ch the real change start may start. So the easiest indicator of innovation in the public policy in Japan is how much the female participation to the executives or top uh, business or top uh, bureaucrat or politician is happening, which the prime minister is uh, clearly committing. But I'm, I'm, I, I 
it will increase, but I'm not so sure if uh, if it in, it can increase as much as uh, he has expected. Because to to make uh, women participation easiest way is to set quota or rationing or whatever the targets uh, legally binding nature. So if that comes, probably the the reform or innovation in Japan will grow much, much faster. I'll be very quick because we're going to have to wrap up and I see more hands going up. Uh, I think government has to stay out of the way of the private sector to enable, in, enable innovation to go. We've had a long track record of trying to pick winners and we don't do too well when we do that. But to provide a, a healthy environment, to provide the kind of uh, structures that enable innovation to thrive. But I'm kind of with Chris that if, if you don't have a stimulus to it, it's going to be very hard to get that kind of initiative. The stimuli don't have to be a crisis. They can be profits. They can be good ideas. And uh, we should be em embracing those things. But I agree with you. It, it often does seem like we're on parallel roads. And uh, getting people to, uh, to work together is, is a challenge. I've got a question there and a question there. Is, this, is your light on because you? Yeah, I had a question. Do, do you have a question? Yeah, I do have a question. OK, but I'm trying to get the order. So in the order of no seeing it. So I'm going to go question. here and here and here. And please make them really brief so we can get them all in. Oh, you want it? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm totally sorry. So you get to go first because Chris Quaife, uh, I'd like to make some comments uh, following on some of the discussions of about 10 minutes ago, uh, which seem to suggest that we have a homogeneous society. I don't think we have anything of the kind. We have quite varying values and time horizons. Uh, Chris Hartshorn has talked about drivers as being the only thing. Uh, if we don't have enablers, the drivers ain't going to know where to drive. And Nancy Olaweiler has just mentioned um, enablers. And we have to invest in enablers. And we have to take the risk that the vision that seems to add up will not add up. But it's getting into new territory. Not just saying, well, if this doesn't uh, earn an economic profit, it's a waste. Investing in good possibilities is a learning experience. It's a very good investment, and it counts in GDP. Um, also, I just uh, have another point on the GDP, that it includes damage. And as such, it can be a perverse indicator that what looks good isn't at all good. And we have to really protect ourselves against that. Okay. Absolutely. I'll jump all over that. Um, I am by no means saying that innovation isn't critical to addressing the challenges that are in front of us. Quite the opposite. I'm saying that um, pragmatic innovation is important. The example I'll give to you, and I'll, I promise I'll make this quick. Um, everyone, everyone looks at the iPhone, everyone looks at Apple and the iPhone and says, wow, that was amazing, right? What few people realize is that's the aggregation of a whole bunch of smaller innovations that got put into one final device. It wasn't a eureka moment that where every single thing in that device all happened all at once. We have to think about energy in the same context. It is a series of smaller innovations that need to be deployed and integrated it doesn't roll out in one eureka moment. And I point to the iPhone as an example of that. Innovate by all means, but innovate intelligently and think about innovations that can integrate with the system as opposed to thinking about disrupting the whole system. And I'm done. I want to make a quick uh, comment on disruptive policy, not innovation. Uh, 30 years ago, China adopted, Chinese leadership believed that China's population size was the hindrance of, of uh, prosperity. They believed that the population, 
uh, China should have the population of the U United States so that they can enjoy the same um, uh, same level of prosperity. So they uh, they set forth the policy of uh, one child one child policy. It's been very controversial and it created a lot of in you know family tragedies and so on. However, with that policy, over the last 30 years, China has produced probably four, 400 to 500 million people. Think about the carbon footprint and carbon, you know, the, the CO2 emissions uh, if, if China has not adopted that policy. So, you know, in Chinese uh, unique history and at that point in time, the leadership did look at the long, rightly or wrongly, they, they look at the long horizon and set forth a policy that uh, changed uh, the growth pattern of a, of a huge population, which has a huge impact on the world population. So uh, it is possible in some circumstances, and in, 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 you know, it happened in China. Thank you. No, you're going to pass. Very. Uh, I, I, I can say this in uh, under a minute. Excellent. And then we can. And then we're on. done. <laughs> so this this question's for uh, for Tanaka-san, and, and it's uh, my name is Dan Blondell, and I'm in the uh, energy storage business. Um, I'm convinced. Um, that nuclear has a uh, it has to be a fundamental piece of our uh, of our energy supply chain going into the future, and as you described Japan's uh, nuclear dilemma, well, it's particularly acute. So the question is, how could the nuclear industry have better handled the the incident in Fukushima, uh, with regards to uh, public opinion, and uh, what will it take to restore public confidence in nuclear energy? Will it, will it actually take Chris and Richard's um, you know, globally disruptive event to uh, convince people that it's uh, something we need? I th you're going to have to answer that outside. Okay. <laughs> okay. See, they're standing I, up, but he agrees. Yeah, I, 